My name is Alberto Nieto. I am a solution engineer at Esri. I work closely with our spatial statistics team. Um, and you'll see here in the title slide that this is really a team effort. I just get to show some of the some of how the tool works, but it's really a, an Esri-wide effort to get this going. So we're excited to share this with you. Um, I want to start with uh, something that I, I think it's safe to say most people are aware of these days. Um, we likely have seen this dashboard that gives us a sense of how many total confirmed cases there are of COVID-19 throughout the world, right? And unfortunately, it also tracks um, how many deaths are occurring and how much of an impact this is occurring, incurring on the, on the population of different countries, different counties in the United States, et cetera. And it's great that we're tracking how many cases are occurring. I think that's a, that's a very important metric to start from. But I think very quickly, the next question becomes, how does that impact our healthcare system? How does that result in, in how many beds we need, how many ICU units a hospital system may need, how many ventilators are needed to keep everyone as safe as possible if they do get infected? And that's where analysis really comes to, to bear, right? We need people that can take that data, the case data, can use analytical tools or statistical methods to project given current trends, given current understanding of the virus, and given a current understanding of how uh, socially connected different people are, how much of an impact this would occur on the population in a forecast. So that's where the CHIME model comes in. This is a, a brief view of what the tool will provide you. It gives uh, a forecast of hospitalization rates, a forecast of um, ICU needs and ventilation needs. And it's all incumbent upon something called uh, an SIR model, Susceptible, Infected, and Recovered Projections model. And we'll get into that and how it works. But I just wanted to give you a, a brief view of where this is going, of what the tool's goal is. It's really to provide a forecast of how much hospital resources are needed for a particular region. Now, I do want to provide the caveat. We are not epidemiologists, particularly myself. Um, I am not an epidemiologist, but we do know quite a bit about GIS. We know about tools that can help other experts such as yourselves, uh, domain experts particularly, who do have good data and a good sense of your local needs or particular needs for your organization. And we can try to make the execution of these models that epidemiologists uh, find and, and make available to the rest of us, we can make that execution as easy as possible so that you can get to work and quickly find the answers that, that we need, right? So CHIME stands for the COVID-19 Hospital Impact Model for Epidemics, and it comes from Penn Medicine, the University of Pennsylvania's healthcare system. And I wanna briefly start there, actually. The tool is based on an existing tool. And the way th this existing tool works is it's available through a web page. And we do wanna provide them a lot of credit. Uh, they essentially instantiated that this model and made it available for the public at large. And the way it works is that you provide input parameters here on the left regarding the hospital parameter, so how many people are apportioned to each hospital. Then you provide some spread and contact parameters. And if we go top to bottom right here, we're specifying the regional population for a particular hospital system. We the the tool provide or allows you to enter a market share of that input population for your particular hospital. And also uh, you require a count of how many hospitalized COVID-19 patients you have in your hospital system. From there, uh, you tell the tool some parameters that relate to the spread and contact of the disease and also the severity of the disease. Um, right now, we are starting with some defaults that were determined through other studies, uh, such as the doubling time. How many days does it take for the disease to double, given no social distancing measures? Um, right now, the, the way you see this graph, it's projecting uh, roughly, 100 days in the future, uh, how many admissions to a hospital will occur, how many admissions to an ICU unit, and how many admissions to a ventilator will be needed. 
And the idea here is that we can start to model what will happen if we close things down, right? If we change social distancing metrics to, let's say, 50 and press enter, then we see a different curve. And this very much is that effect of flattening the curve, lowering how many uh, people get infected at once so that the hospital system can bear with the impacts, right? So that's the goal of this tool, to model and simulate different scenarios where you may have uh, a typical uh, operation where people can go to work and go to school, et cetera, and then what will happen if things close down or if people are isolated from each other, and how would that therefore benefit the healthcare system? So that's how it works in the app, but the app really lets you enter one hospital at a time, and it doesn't provide spatial context for what you're doing. So what we did is we created a geoprocessing tool in ArcGIS Pro, and this geoprocessing tool gives you the ability to essentially run that model using uh, GIS data, using a perhaps a shapefile or a feature class of hospitals or administrative boundaries, and we'll get into that uh, in just a little while. So I want to start simple. I have a, a simple data set of a hospital in Cape Coral, Florida. This hospital, if we take a look at uh, the pop-up for this particular feature, we have some information regarding the total population that that hospital's catchment area would include, how many currently known infections there are in the region, the number of currently hospitalized COVID-19 patients, and this is synthetic data, uh, and also the resources at that hospital, how many beds do we have there, how many ICUs, and how many ventilators there are. So the way we run the tool is quite simple. I'm gonna simply drag and drop that feature class over to my input feature class parameter. Uh, one quick tip, and I'll give you plenty of tips today. I really like to be explicit with the name of the output feature classes. So I'm gonna call this uh, hospital daily forecast. And I'm gonna call it with the current date, so 200430. And then, so this is the primary output of the feature class of the tool. It's a daily forecast output feature class, but you also have a secondary output, which is a summary of, of the resource usage at this hospital given current infection rates. So I'm gonna change this name to, instead of being daily forecast, I'm gonna call it summary. And you never really just run this tool once and call it a day and, and move on. I think it's incumbent upon most modelers and most people that use forecasts to run several different iterations with different parameters to kind of come to an agreement on, on what the model is saying, right? So I suggest that your naming convention helps you organize that. So then we pass a total population. So once again, that's how many people are apportioned to this particular hospital. And we're also gonna tell the tool the number of currently hospitalized patients in that particular hospital. So that's a field, we're just gonna pass it there. We tell the tool then how many days do we want to project in the future? We want to project in this case 60. And we'll get into some best practices regarding some of these parameters, but I just want to show you really quick how it works. Then we're going to tell the tool what is the start date for our projections? So today is the 30th. Let's go ahead and start from today, 60 days in the future. Uh, you can tell the tool, give me a unique ID for each hospital. Right now we're just running one, so it's pretty straightforward. And then here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. You pass some parameters that tell the tool um, how the disease is spreading and how deadly it is. And you can tell that as either a constant, a single value for all the data that you're passing, or you can specify a field that specifies all of that information. Since it's a single hospital, we're gonna keep it simple. Uh, we're gonna just tell it, here's a constant value. And the default value for doubling time is four days. This is based on a study that Penn Medicine cited. But if you do have other data, for instance, if you have the, if you know when the first confirmed case in your region was, and you know the current amount of cases, you could uh, make a, an assumption of a doubling time that is more particular for your region. Uh, for social distancing, I'm actually gonna decrease this to zero. I'm just basically tell the tool, show me the forecast if people are not isolating. And then the rest of the values I'm gonna keep by default, but we're gonna get into those in just a little while. And I'm gonna run the tool. So again, the, the emphasis here is to make this uh, admittedly pretty complex uh, model simple for any GIS user to run uh, as they speak with different health agencies or epidemiologists in their, in their region. 
So here's the output of the tool. You get the two outputs, the daily forecast and the summary. So let's start with the daily forecast. What I like to do is uh, create, or actually use the charts that the tool gives you. Double click them. So there's one, two, and then there's a third chart here. And I like to stack them in this arrangement. Obviously, you may have your personal preference, but this really helps me see what the model gave us. At the bottom left, you see the new daily admissions for that particular hospital based on the inputs. So it's projecting, given that synthetic data, that about 21 days from the start, we will reach a peak of new daily hospitalizations at around 191. Now keep in mind, this is new daily, meaning that this is how many new hospitalizations will occur just on that day, on the 21 days from the start. If you want to see the total active cases or hospitalizations, you look at this right, uh, chart on the right, the daily census. This takes into account how many people have been in the hospital already, given this new day, and also how many people have left. So this is much higher, uh, and it makes sense, right? So you have about 1,300 patients at this peak time if no social distancing is occurring. And then finally, this chart at the top right that gives you a sense of how the population is moving from being susceptible to being infected, and finally to being recovered. So that's a view of the tool, but I really want to get into how all of this works. Uh, so let's get into it. Behind the scenes, uh, the way this works is through a model approach for epidemiology called susceptible, infected, and recovered. Any given person uh, that is being evaluated can be one of these three states. For instance, if you're susceptible, you're a healthy individual that has not received COVID-19 and, and you are susceptible to receiving COVID-19. An infected individual is one who is currently infected and can infect others. And finally, you have a recovered individual. As the name implies, these are people that have gone through the infection, recovered, and for the model's purposes, we are assuming that they cannot receive COVID-19 again. And what we're doing here, I want to start with a basic view of how this works. And I think this will make sense to a lot of people. I think we see it all over the news that uh, of how this disease spreads, right, and why we're isolating. So for the purposes of, of, a, of a quick example here, let's say that we have a population of 20 individuals. And the model doesn't really concern itself with how the infection started or or where particularly it started, it just wants to know how many people are infected at the earliest date possible. So let's say that we have three people infected. Now on day one, that's the status of our, of our data set. We have 17 individuals susceptible, three individuals infected. Day two, the infection rate uh, has kicked in and there's three new individuals that went some, from susceptible to infected. Day three, the infection is now starting to spread and most of our population now is in that infected category with only a few individuals that perhaps live pretty remotely or took some hygiene measures to wash their hands, stay isolated, wear masks, etc. And they ultimately were never infected. But now the disease is running its course through that population and now they're going to that third bucket of recovered. And, and in this, in a similar manner, in which they became infected, if the disease has a typical rate or a typical duration, then these people essentially will go to that third bucket and hopefully not infect others again. So let's take a look at that through a chart. Day one, we have 17 folks susceptible, three folks infected. Day two, the disease is starting to spread. We now have six infected and 14 susceptible and so on until now we have more infected and now we're reaching a peak of infections and all of a sudden we now see this third new bucket this third new line of recovered individuals and that starts to be the predominant category so that's the that's the goal of this model how do we determine these three lines how do we model these three paths that people or these three states that any particular individual can be in during this epidemic and that's where the, the model comes from, right? Or that's where the model really kicks in. Let's take a look at how a susceptible individual becomes infected. Obviously, you may have this happy, healthy individual just minding their own business. And unfortunately, this infected individual may come into close contact with them and 
let out a, a few coughs here or there, and then go on their own jolly way, and all of a sudden we now have a susceptible individual becoming infected. I think that makes sense to pretty much all of us at this point. But mathematically, the way that it works in this model is that you take today's total susceptible and you subtract the amount of susceptible that became infected and that becomes tomorrow's total susceptible. If you pause and think about this, it's pretty obvious, right? <laughs> but the reason I make it very obvious is because uh, the formula, if you look in the documentation, doesn't really feel that intuitive when you look at it. But if you tie it to these three statements, I think it's pretty easy to, to understand. S of T plus one is just tomorrow's total susceptible equals today's total susceptible minus this interesting assortment of variables. So let's take a look at those. S and I are multiplied together because the more infected individuals you have, the more sick people uh, or the more likely it is for any given susceptible person to get infected. And then there's this uh, new parameter called beta. And that is analogous to, that is highly related to something called R0, which is how many individuals will a given infected person uh, infect while they're sick. Uh, in this case, it's, it's really specifically the effective contact rate. How easy is it for the disease to spread? And it's a measure both of how infectious the disease is and also how long the disease lasts in an infectious phase. So that's how S becomes I, how susceptible becomes infected. And that's how the math works in the back. Now, next day infected, basically the people that will become infected is quite simple if you also think about it in these terms. It's equal to today's total infected plus the people that just became infected from that susceptible bucket minus a new bucket, which is the amount of infected people who recovered. Makes sense, right? Uh, mathematically, this is how it's expressed in the documentation. So if you see this, don't let it scare you. It's really just this set of statements uh, interpreted as variables. So you have I of T plus one, tomorrow's total infected, equal to today's total infected, plus that metric that we saw in the previous slide, minus a new metric. And this new variable really corresponds to the recovery time. How long does it take the disease to run its course? So how does I become R? Because we don't have effective treatment, uh, generally this is just a matter of time. Essentially given enough time, infected individuals become recovered. And the chart for this third line is quite straightforward. Tomorrow's total recovered equals today's total recovered plus the amount of infected people who recovered. So pretty straightforward. And then this new parameter, once again, is just uh, the length of time that the disease needs to uh, run its course. So there's the three lines. This is an SIR model behind the scenes, uh, the three equations that give us these three lines. And this is the basis for the simulation. So the part where the CHIME model comes in and adds another wrinkle to this SIR model is how it considers hospitalizations, ICUs, intensive care units, and ventilations. So we know I from, so infected, from what we just went through, right? We know how many people are going to become infected or we have an estimate, better stated. And we do need to know, or at least provide the model, a rate of hospitalization. We need to give the model a sense of, of those infected, how many people do we project to go to the hospital? And this likely can be based on epidemiological studies or observed data in your, in your given region. So we have some smart defaults that are based on, on Penn Medicine's assessment, but if you have data for this, one of the best practices is go ahead and plug in your own data. Uh, and what we do then, or what the model does, is from that rate of hospitalization, it determines uh, how many people that are in the I bucket will be in a hospital in a given time step. So we'll say that, let's say out of these 10 infected individuals, four of them are really going through a hard time and they will need hospitalization. So the health, uh, the healthcare system will need to support them and you have a 40% hospitalization rate. So that then becomes another bucket of people. And from there, you also provide the tool, the rate of the hospitalized, hospitalized patients that need uh, intensive care units. 
So if you provide the tool a value of 20% ICU admission rate, then the tool will create another bucket here. And finally, for ventilators, which are a critical need uh, in the worst cases, if you have 10% of infected that ultimately have to go through ventilation, then the tool will create that subset. And those charts that you saw earlier are really simulations from the I bucket and broken out into these sub buckets based on the rates that we are either observing on the data or just passing as an explicit value when you run the tool. So when you see those charts that I put together or that I dragged out to the bottom and bottom right of the map, this is how these charts are produced. We take the infected bucket, take the rate, and then model out for each time step how many we expect. Uh, one important thing is that uh, we ask you for a doubling time and that tells the tool how many infected there were in the beginning time step. So that is a critical factor in the, in the tool. And that parameter, we're gonna take a look at it in a little bit of a closer fashion. So that's the tool. Um, let's take a look at a, at a bigger demonstration. So this was a, a simple use case for a single hospital. More often than not, what we're seeing from, from the users that we collaborate with is that they're running it for not a single hospital, but they're running it for an entire region. So let's say something like this, Florida. And for Florida, what we're looking at is not really an individual hospital, but we're looking at counties. And for a particular county, you may have a sense of how many total hospital beds there are, how many total ICUs there are, and also how many total cases uh, are hospitalized. If you have that information, then you can model. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, I already have the tool uh, installed and loaded here, and we can go through the installation in just a bit. And the way we're gonna run it in this case is we have our input. What we're visualizing here is the count of COVID-19 hospitalizations in March 31st. So this is data of some time ago. I'm gonna drag and drop over here to uh, the tool. And while this is repeating what I did a little while ago, I think repetition sometimes is pretty helpful, right? So let's go ahead and say uh, daily forecast, Florida. and go ahead and say, we're gonna model a scenario with no social distancing first. And this can be helpful if you're trying to determine what will happen if things reopen, right? So then uh, over here, I'm gonna change the summary output feature class into just summary Florida zero social distancing. We're gonna specify our population field. Uh, I'm gonna navigate over here to the bottom where we have a field called county population. And then we're gonna specify the number of currently hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So that I have as a field called uh, C hospital, yes. We're gonna project 60 days in the future. And actually uh, this data pertains to March 31st. So I'm gonna go back to March 31st, specify that as our start date. In this case, it is very helpful to provide a unique ID. And the idea here is that uh, when you create these charts, there's some uh, nice, techniques you can use to actually look at which county will hit its peak sooner than others. So having a county name or a county ID can be really helpful there. So from here, we're gonna expand the constant model parameters and we're gonna leave most of these things as is. So there's the doubling time. This roughly accounts to the beta in how susceptible becomes infected. We're gonna keep it as a default of four uh, and uh, for social distancing, because we want to model what happens if people are not distancing, uh, we're going to change that to zero. Now for the rates, we're going to leave them by default, and these are based on assessments by Penn Medicine. If you have empirical data that tells you a different rate of hospitalizations in your region, perhaps it's a bit more grave or a bit less grave, then you can plug that in here. And this is going to be the value across the board for all of Florida. We're gonna also pass additional outputs for visualization. And those additional outputs relate to the capacity. So how many beds does each county have? Let's go ahead and pass that in. All the way down here, we have a sum of staffed beds. We also have, we don't have ventilators per county in this particular data set, but I do have the sum of ICU beds. And if we pass this, then your summary output feature class has uh, a nice, uh, account of when you will surpass capacity and by how much, which can be really helpful for 
planning, obviously, and trying to determine which counties are going to experience the harshest circumstances. So here's the output. Uh, a few things that I want to share with you. So the output is, uh, let's take a look at this attribute table. This has uh, as many records for each county as there are days that you are projecting. So each record is a day for a particular county. You have this day field, so day from the start, the date, and then you have the new hospitalizations, you have new ICU admissions, new ventilated admissions, and keep in mind the new means that for just that day, how many new people, how many new ICUs, and how many new ventilations are coming in. In addition to the ones before, this gives you the, uh, the census. And the census also takes into account people that are now recovered and leaving the hospital system. And then for those buckets, the three buckets that we were looking at earlier in the slides, the susceptible, infected, recovered, there's the three fields for each day, for each county. And that lets us produce those three charts. So one thing that we can do now that we have the entire data set, uh, you can time enable it since you have those fields. So we're gonna right click, by the way, I'm going a little fast here, so I'll slow down. I'm gonna right click this layer, go to properties, select time here, and specify that we do have a time field in the output. That time field can be date, and then we can simply select okay. And then what happens is that um, we can go over here to the time ribbon in ArcGIS Pro, enable time, and you can play essentially an animation of how different counties will experience the, the forecast of hospitalizations. So right over here, you may see parts of Miami, parts of Hillsborough County, parts of Orange County in Orlando, parts of Duval County up in Jacksonville start to grow as we get further and further in the, in the simulation by the tool. So that's one technique you can use to evaluate what's happening. Time animations can be useful, but to me, what's more useful than anything else is the charts. So as I mentioned earlier, what I like to do is uh, double click each chart and start to lay out uh, our projections. And if you recall what we were going through in the slides, uh, these are the different breakouts for hospitalized ICU ventilations and also that all important SIR chart, susceptible, infected, and recovered. And this is a view for the entire data set. Uh, this is for all counties in aggregate. Uh, if we evaluate this, with no social distancing, you see a peak about 30 day, 38 days in the future with uh, roughly 139,000 hospitalizations. This is essentially worst case scenario. People did not hide, did not stay at home, they kept going to work, etc. So this is a pretty grim picture of what would happen. Very often what you may want to do is run the tool again. So what we can do is basically compare what would happen if we instead change it to, let's say 30% social distancing. So I'm gonna change that here, change that there, and all we need to do is go down to our parameter, change it from zero to 30, and create our new outputs. So this is our second run of the tool. And one thing that I recommend when you're comparing uh, one scenario to another is make sure your charts match in terms of the axes. So we have two sets of outputs now here. We have a scenario with zero social distancing and a scenario with 30 social distancing. And let me show you what that actually would uh, look like in comparison through the charts. So quite a few charts here, please bear with me. We're gonna put these together. So, uh, and then also we're gonna make sure that this chart matches the first chart in terms of the axis. So you can select the properties of your chart select uh, axes and get the maximum value. If I do that for this particular chart, I think the maximum is about, yep, 140,000 almost. So I'm gonna copy that value, go to the second chart for the scenario with zero, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 30 social distancing and paste it there. And now we can compare apples to apples. So scenario on the left, is no social distancing. Scenario on the right is 30% social distancing uh, in the same axes. And you can very much start to see that phenomena flattening the curve uh, modeled, right? Uh, the idea here would be that you wanna push the curve down and make it take longer for us to reach that peak. 
so that can be one projection and, and this I think is more realistic in the sense of what's actually happening these days, right? People did isolate. The other set of tricks that I want to show you with if you're running this tool, uh, Flora Veil uh, suggested uh, a really useful technique. So let's do this. What I like to do is bring all the metrics for the scenario where we have zero social distancing again. I'm going to create one more chart. And this chart is going to be a bar chart. And the bar chart is going to have a view of uh, each county's uh, average or sum of new hospitalizations. And then we're going to set some selection filters on these two bottom charts. So basically what that means is that if I select a feature on the map or a feature in this chart, then the charts will only show me the, the data for that particular county. So over here is Broward County. And now you see the peak new admissions and the peak census of admissions just for that county and compare it to perhaps another county, uh, Miami-Dade, or maybe a county that is likely to experience uh, less of a severe situation. And that can be a useful way if, for instance, you're supporting a meeting where you're evaluating what are the scenarios for all the counties in my state or in my region. If you set up this scenario, you can quickly kind of um, select different regions or even select them in the map. If you select them in the map, the thing that I recommend is uh, drag a rectangle so that you can select all the days in the map for that region. If you just click on the map, you basically get the most recent entry, if that makes sense. So that's one technique. Uh, one other useful technique that I really um, favor and some of the users that we were helping with this model found this particularly useful is this idea of looking at peaks for individual regions. So the way that would happen is we create a, instead of a bar chart, we're going to create a line chart. And for this line chart, using that output data, we're going to give it the hospitalized census. And we're going to split it by the county name. Gives us a lot of different uh, counties. <laughs> and then we're, for the numeric field, we're going to specify a hospitalized census. Uh, and we don't want the sum. We just want the raw hospitalized census. And Whoops, instead of date, instead of date being hospitalized census, I want the date to be the actual date. There we go. So um, what I like to do here is do a few things. We now have this chart on the right that looks pretty chaotic. So what I like to do here is set an extent filter, filter by the extent of the map. And now what you can do is basically zoom into a region and compare just a few counties and start to see, okay, which county will hit its peak sooner than the others. If we zoom into this level, we only see, let's see, uh, six different counties. Let's go actually really close and just get maybe Broward and Miami-Dade uh, and compare essentially how does this peak compare to the other peak and when will it hit? So Broward County is just about a day earlier than uh, Miami-Dade County. So what's kind of interesting here is that most of the states, uh, or sorry, most of the counties are hitting their peak right around the same time. There's some counties over here that have a later peak than others. And this takes me to something that I really recommend. Uh, what we did in this case is we ran the tool with a flat value for every county for social distancing. We went to constant model parameters and told it use 30% or 0% for every single county. But where it gets really interesting is where you give it uh, variables that can vary spatially. So for example, there's a very interesting data set called Unicast. And Unicast lets you uh, make an assessment of how much social distancing may be occurring in a particular county, given data from mobile devices. And it takes a snapshot at one day, takes a snapshot at a second day, and measures how much mobility is, is there happening between those two days. Then it gives each county uh, a grade, and that grade uh, pertains to essentially how much uh, of a difference has happened between date one and date two. All that means is that now I can break it out so that instead of saying for the entire state, I want you to consider social distancing as 30%, I can tell the tool, no, uh, each county is kind of handling things differently. Let's pass a field called reduction in social distancing that is fed from this unicast data 
And now when we run the model, it's going to take into effect all these differences in social distancing, some counties that are not really adhering by those guidelines and some counties that are doing a better job adhering to social distancing guidelines. Um, so regardless of how you feel about social distancing, it can be very important to take into account how these different counties are really behaving, right, or different regions or even different hospitals. So let's run the tool in that sense. And I should have renamed it actually instead of 30 social distancing, I should have said this is dynamic. This is now spatially varying based on the inputs. And um, now that we have these new inputs with uh, discrete social distancing uh, values for each county, what we can do is once again create that um, chart, that line chart that lets, that look, lets us look at different peaks for each county. Let's create that really quick. Maybe if you see it one more time, uh, you'll remember how to create it. So remember the date or number is simply the date. The aggregation is not, there's not going to be an aggregation. We're just simply going to select the hospitalized census and we're going to split it by county name. And there are a lot of counties, so it's a little bit of a difficult chart to read, but uh, that's okay. And then set our spatial filter. So filter by extent. And now we see that the peaks, because there is some level of social distancing happening, not only is this axis much lower than what we were looking at earlier, but there's these very different peaks county by county. So if I zoom way into maybe the southern tip of Florida, the Everglades, uh, Collier County, et cetera, you see that there's these very different regions that are, because of the way they're behaving differently, are likely to expect different peaks. In fact, the model at 60 days really can't pick uh, or can't pinpoint a specific peak uh, because it's been pushed so far ahead in the in the future according to those metrics. So those are a few tips uh, with running, uh, particularly if you're looking at a region where you're comparing a lot of different counties and a lot of different uh, social distancing metrics. And that, that same uh, methodology can apply not just to social distancing, but really to anything. So if you have a county that has a higher doubling time than another county, let's say that you have an urban area where the density of people and some event had a super spreader, maybe the doubling time in that particular county is much lower. It, the, the disease is spreading much faster there. So you may want to pinpoint a field that has those values for each county. Same with uh, rates of hospitalization, ventilation, et cetera. That can be really powerful if you bring in other layers with uh, demographic data, for example. Uh, something that a lot of people are doing these days is examining comorbidities. So if people have pre-existing heart conditions, diabetes, asthma, et cetera, those can be important factors in the hospitalization rate. And while to start, it can be okay to pass a single hospitalization rate, um, a better analyst may be able to incorporate that information and really look at hyperlocal effects of comorbidities, right? If you have a lot of sick people, especially in the South and, and in different regions of the country, they're finding that that different um, social vulnerability indices are resulting in different hospitalization rates. The disease seems to be a bit more fatal or even more dangerous in, in different parts of the country. So in summary, we ran the tool quite a few times. We started with a single hospital. We also ran it for a variety of counties. We looked at passing a single value for all of these parameters across the board. And we also started taking a look at passing different values based on each county, which can be very helpful if you're trying to get more accurate with the models. Uh, one more important thing to take into account is uh, how to communicate these results. So certainly ArcGIS Pro, I think, is very useful to interpret the results. And it can be very useful if you're an analyst or a data scientist that is looking to uh, build a model for your particular situation. But a decision maker may not be privy to how ArcGIS Pro works or may, be, may not be interested in all the gory details here that I'm showing. So there is something quite important, which is that there is a, an application now that we can use. So let me see if I can find this. If we go to our tool documentation, um, my apologies. So here's the link. Uh, towards the end of this uh, extra, uh, of this session, I'll post quite a few links that give you resources for how to use this tool. 
and also take a look at different methodologies that you can consider. So towards the end of this uh, blog post that I'm going to link on the chat, there's a new addition to the Chime tool, which is that it produces an output that is compatible with a web app. And this web app is over here. So this is called the Capacity Analysis Configurable Application. And if we look at this, the way it looks is that it really is meant to compare two scenarios, just like we were doing a little bit ago. Scenario on the left was run with social distancing at 29%. Scenario on the right was run with social distancing at 50%. And at the top, you select essentially the variable that you care about. Perhaps it's how many people are hospitalized. So let's keep it at, at that level. And then the chart at the bottom shows you that curve, right? So essentially scenario on the left in orange, scenario on the right in blue. And this kind of simplifies a lot of that view. And if you zoom in a little bit closer, then you can actually click a particular county and see the data just for that county and a pop-up that uh, gives you a little bit of information. This also gets at that summary feature class. So that tells you uh, what is the ma maximum amount of patients at the peak? Uh, what is the maximum amount of ICUs and ventilations in a single day? And that can be really important if you're a decision maker that is trying to determine whether a field hospital is needed, whether ventilators need to be routed from one location to another, et cetera. So this field app is has become quite important to help communicate those results. Okay, I want to give you five quick tips if you get started with this tool. Hopefully this explanation has helped and hopefully this demonstration has cleared a lot of the, the any hesitation you may have to get started. But here's a few tips. Tip number one is to definitely read the documentation. We spent a lot of time writing it and making sure it's clear. Um, the intent is that most of the questions you will have up front likely have been answered in the documentation. And also, I recommend not just our documentation. So in the Chime geoprocessing tool webpage, which we'll link, here is the documentation that really takes you through a lot of what I spoke about, but it explains every single parameter and what it pertains to. And at the bottom of this doc, there is a, a sample scenario. So this example workflow is my recommendation for you to do as soon as you get the tool. Go through this example workflow. When you download the tool, it actually comes with the sample data. And the sample data is synthetic. It's not real data, but it can be very useful if you're just looking to get your hands wet in the, in the tool and get comfortable using it. Uh, but all the steps are here. And it also takes you through how to publish those outputs and make the outputs compatible with that web app that I was uh, showcasing a little bit ago. So the doc uh, has a lot of information, but it's very, very helpful. If you read through this, generally speaking, you should know how, how the tool works at length. The other documentation that I definitely recommend you look at is the Penn Medicine documentation. They did a great job. Uh, there's a link over here, how to use Chime. And this link really takes you through the all the information for the SIR model and the way they put this model together. So there's the three equations that we looked at in the PowerPoint. So now you hopefully know how these work and not, and not really shy away. My second tip is to uh, don't project over 100 days. The idea here is that the further in the future you project, the less accurate the model. And that goes in hand with almost every modeling practice, right? And this value really was recommended to us in our conversations with Penn Medicine. Uh, the modelers there and the people that developed the Chime model said, anything beyond 100 days becomes very, very inaccurate. So generally speaking, the default is 60 and somewhere around that range should be somewhat safe, although that, that paradigm of every model is wrong except some are useful uh, lies true here. So, so you do have to be careful with estimates and projections and modeling uh, where it's better than a wild guess, but it's still an estimate. Tip number three, determine whether you want to apply single values for your entire analysis or allow fields that vary the input spatially. And that goes in hand with the parameters that I went over, whether you specify them as a hard-coded value that every hospital or every county has, or a field that has different values for hospitalization rates, doubling rates, et cetera. Tip number four, if you do not have population data for your hospital area or for your county, uh, you can use the Enrich tool. 
So for those of you that may have not used it, the Enrich tool can be found in ArcGIS Pro. You can look for it in geoprocessing, find Enrich. And what Enrich lets you do is it lets you pass, uh, let's say your input with counties. Uh, you can specify variables that you want to enrich with, and some of those variables could be population. So I could simply find, give me the total population per county and enrich it with that information. So it'll uh, use either business analyst data or your ArcGIS online organization and add that information. If you have hospital catchment areas, you can enrich it with other variables that may be important for you. So that's tip number four. Finally, tip number five, and this is very, very important. While we are fans of Chime and we have worked very hard on this tool, uh, it is not the only model you should run, or and it's certainly not the, other mo the only model you can run. It should be one of several models that you are considering. Uh, and this is kind of a broader discussion about what data science is, right? Um, to me, data science very much is similar to being a lawyer. <laughs> You're making a case for something that you are trying to find an answer to. You're, you don't have a 100% certainty, but you find all these different modeling techniques that seem to be agreeing on an answer. And while it's not 100% correct, it certainly can be better than a wild guess. And Chime is just one approach to do that. There are several others, each with their own pros and cons. And we hope that Chime certainly becomes one of those, but uh, we do encourage you to look at other models in conjunction with Chime. Uh, one more tip here, Chime is one of the more pessimistic models. So you do need to take that into consideration. Chime seems to, in comparison with other approaches and techniques, it does give you uh, very likely what the worst case scenario can be. Uh, a lot of other models have other wrinkles that can incorporate reopening, and we are working hard on bringing additional models into geoprocessing tools that you can leverage. Okay, so that just about wraps us up. Uh, in the chat, I'm gonna post a few links, and what I'm gonna do here is start with uh, quite a few. The first one is gonna be to the Penn Medicine app. We do wanna give them full credit for the work that they did. Uh, the Penn Medicine app is what we ran at the very beginning of the session. Uh, I want to provide another link here, and this is called the guidance for using the social distancing parameter. This is a paper, uh, this links to uh, a blog post and a research paper that really can help you understand what should you pass to the social distancing parameter. That can be quite critical when you model. Next, I want to give you the link to the Chime geoprocessing tool. So the Chime geoprocessing tool, uh, and hopefully you see it here in the chat, uh, this is the link to basically download the tool. Once you click that link, it will take you to this web page. You can download the tool. It comes as a zip file. And once you unzip it, you have uh, the geoprocessing tool that you can link to from ArcGIS Pro. The README document or the documentation tells you exactly how to install it. The next uh, link I want to provide you is the capacity analysis web application. That's the piece I showed at the end. If you want to configure that with the outputs from the Chime tool, uh, there's the link for how to do that. Uh, very important as well is the blog post that I mentioned. Our product engineers, Lynn and Ankita, did a terrific job basically outlining what the tool is meant to do. And uh, reading that blog post is definitely worthwhile if you're looking to see how this works and also some considerations generally. Uh, now I wanna share a few additional links and these are regarding data sets that can help you if you're really starting to uh, use this tool. So the first one is the Definitive Healthcare USA Hospitals Bed or Hospital Beds uh, resource. And in the chat, you should now see the link to this. Uh, if you're watching a recording, uh, we likely will have these links available hopefully in the recording or through some other resource. And this link that I just provided is a link to the Living Atlas layer for Definitive Healthcare. Uh, USA Hospital Beds. If we look at this in our browser here, uh, what this is is essentially a really good data set if you don't have hospital beds for your particular region. If we open it up in a map viewer, it not only gives you the locations, at least in the United States, for all the hospitals, but also gives you uh, the sum of hospital beds and the number of uh, ICU units, which can be quite important. Uh, Johns Hopkins 
has provided a lot of good data and the dashboard in conjunction with the layer that feeds the dashboard is very helpful if you're looking at cases. So I provided a link there in the chat now. Um, and I wanna provide links to the social distancing data that I referenced in the demo. So one more link here, and that's Unicast. If I click that link, that takes us to the Living Atlas layer. Let's take a look at that. So there's the link to the Living Atlas layer. If you open this in a map viewer, you actually see that default symbology for the grades that every county is getting, uh, and this is latest available. You see uh, the different assessment of uh, using mobile phone data for how different counties are doing in terms of social distancing. And there is one new data set that I'm curious to try. I haven't had a chance to try it yet, but that's Blue Dot, Blue Dot Mobility Data. I just provided the link in the chat. Uh, but let's take a look at it here. Blue Dot is quite similar, but they actually have quite a few different breakouts for social distancing. Uh, so this can be quite useful for not just Chime, but quite a few other purposes. So take a look at this data set if you're curious. The Living Atlas, as you may notice, has a wealth of information that you can access. So thank you all for the time. I want to end with this quote. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful, and hopefully Chime is one of those useful models to you. Thank you again for your time. At this point, I can take a few questions. Great. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, first question, does the tool use ArcGIS online credits? It does not. It runs locally on ArcGIS Pro. If you use Enrich to prepare data for that, that can take credits, but there's uh, some ways to do that also locally. If you have business analyst desktop, you can do it without consuming credits. But to be specific, Chime does not consume credits. Thanks. Uh, so this next question, um, the user has run the tool um, on the county level for regions anywhere from 60 to 90 days out, and they've noticed that a lot of the counties stop having an output earlier than that, sometimes only 20 days out while others go as far as they're supposed to. Um, are they encountering some kind of cutoff? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, it depends on it really depends on the inputs, and that may not be a satisfactory answer. But when you see that type of output, there's a few things I recommend. Run a single hospital or a single county in the Chime app, and make sure that the outputs are matching. And also feel free to reach out to us because I am curious if you're seeing projections cut off. It could be the case that essentially the math lands at most people reaching the susceptible stage earlier, or maybe there's a harsh drop off if the social distancing metric is pretty high. But without seeing a picture, without seeing the actual data, it's a little tough to answer. So maybe what we can do is I can provide my contact information and you can uh, share your outputs with us and we can take a little bit of a closer look. Great. Um, and this one, this question might lead more into the um, epidemiologist side of things. Uh, but one person asked why um, it does not take into account death rate and it's just recovered people. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, death rates are not part of this particular implementation of SIR. Other models do have death as a consideration, but in this case, the goal is to understand uh, peak resource needs at hospitals rather than to model death rates. Uh, there is another tool we're working on that will consider death as a separate bucket within the recovered population. So instead of just getting SIR and R is all the people that went through the it would be SIR, where R is people that either go through the disease or unfortunately passed away. Uh, but in this case, the again, keep in mind, the goal is just to model peaks and resource needs at those peaks. So in that context, while death is very important, uh, the more important factor for the, for the use of CHIME, in my opinion, is how many hospital beds do you have and how many hospital beds are we projecting? Same with ICU, same with ventilations. Great question, though. Uh, so the last question, um, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase here, um, but are you, 
is something like this able to tell us when we can return to normal um, as a follow-on, um, specifically like Georgia and Florida are returning to normal? Would something like this factor into that decision? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I encourage you to, <laughs> to consult with others in addition to what I'm about to say here. But Chime is very useful uh, honestly, to project what will happen if we go into social distancing. And there are other methods that we are working on that also incorporate interventions where you may go from social distancing to opening. Uh, Chime, I think, is quite useful just if we're evaluating getting staying in social distancing or getting even more stringent. So while we did go through all of this, and it is a very useful tool, if your particular question is, uh, when can we open again? I encourage you to use Chime, but also other modeling techniques. And the modeling technique that we're soon to release, um, it's still in the works, but hopefully we can have it out as soon as possible, hopefully in the next few days, maybe weeks, uh, but hopefully days. It's a COVID search model from the CDC, and that COVID search model uh, is able to incorporate different uh, interventions, and those interventions could be negative social distancing, essentially going from full isolation to no isolation, and how do those peaks then manifest in the projections? So, uh, yeah, I guess to summarize that answer, Chime can help, but there, admittedly, there's other methods that are a bit better if you are looking to see when can we reopen. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Alberto. This has been very enlightening. Um, and I will follow up with an email that will include all the links that have been provided and uh, the slides, as well as a recording of the video. Thanks again for your time. Enjoy your day.